Hello, welcome to the fifth and final of our lunchtime agritourism webinars. Today's topic is the delivery, hospitality, and five-car customer experience. I'm Penny Leff. I'm agritourism coordinator with the University of California Small Farm Program. I'll be your host today. And behind the scenes today, making everything run smoothly, moderating the question and answer, is Melanie Chang of Farms Reach. I'll tell you more about Farms Reach in a little bit. While I'm talking, please take a minute to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Answer the poll on the left, on the lower left of your screen, about who you are, and you can check as many boxes as apply. And then tell us a little about how familiar you are how familiar you are with today's topic, hospitality and customer service. The webinar back here. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, here's a little short outline of today's program. First, a few tips on using the Adobe Connect system. Then I'll tell you about the webinar series and the larger project that it's part of. And then we'll hear from um, Scotty Jones of the U.S. Farm Stay Association talking about five-star customer service. Then we'll hear from Megan Bishop Sanderson, who's with Bishop's Pumpkin Farm, talking about Bishop's Pumpkin Farm customer service program. Then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, if you can't hear me, turn up the volume on your speakers. There isn't any music. You just get to hear me. But uh, if you're not hearing anything, you need your speakers turned up. Um, if you want to use the question and answer window. It is on the lower left of your screen. Type in your questions and any comments you have for the presenters in the chat window on the lower left. You can type in questions or comments at any time during the session, but we'll be holding questions until the end of the presentations. You won't see uh, your questions and other people's questions, but Melanie will be receiving them and moderating them and passing them along to the speakers. Uh, you can go to full screen um, by, you can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking the button at the top of your screen, and you can click it again to see the chat window again and type in a question or comment. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and the presentation slides will be posted online, both on both on the Farms Reach California Agritourism Group and on the project webpage on the Small Farm Program website. This, these webinars are part of a larger project which is managed by the UC Small Farm Program. The project is called Building a Network for California Agritourism Development and Promotion. And this project is funded by the USDA Farmers Market Promotion Program. For this project, we're working in partnership with Farms Reach. And Farms Reach is an online platform that helps farmers connect with each other. The project includes a series of webinars. It includes an ongoing online conversation on, on the Farms Reach website on the California Agritourism Group. And the project also includes, coming this winter, we will be organizing four regional conferences uh, to discuss agritourism in four different regions of California. The webinars that have happened so far are about uh, the strategy, your marketing strategy, identifying, reaching, and con connecting with your agritourism customers. We talked about social media and website success. We talked about the rules, um, permits, and uh, regulations for agritourism. We talked about working with your tourism community. And this is the final web the final webinar in the series about um, customer service and hospitality. Uh, you can see the recordings for the webinars on the Farms Reach uh, California Agritourism Group, or you can go to the Small Farm Program website. Just Google UC Small Farm Program. Click on the Agritourism tab. And when you get there, click on Agritourism Conversations. And that'll take you to the page with all the information. And 
We hope you will join the ongoing con agritourism conversation that we're having on Farms Reach. Between the webinars, the presenters are answering questions and everyone's chatting with each other on the California Agritourism Group on Farms Reach. To join, go to farmsreach.com, go to the community tab, and the drop down on the drop down menu, click groups, and on the groups, select California agritourism and join the conversation. Now for today's program. Today we'll, we will hear from Scotty Jones with U.S. Farm Stay Association and from Megan Bishop Sanderson from Bishop's Pumpkin Farm. Scotty Jones is the founder and now executive director of the U.S. Farm Stay Association. She and her husband have run a sheep farm, Leaping Lamb Farm, in Alsi, Oregon since 2003, and Scotty has hosted a farm stay there since 2006. Scotty often speaks at farm conferences about how to start a farm stay, the economics of the operation, the challenges of hospitality, the regulations, and the expected impacts to time and the bottom line. It is her goal in life to define a new American travel need niche known as the farm stay, both to travelers and to the agricultural community. Locally, Scotty is involved with Travel Oregon and Oregon State University Extension to promote agritourism in the state. She was part of the work group responsible for the passage of a limited liability agritourism bill passed in Oregon last summer, 2015. OK, Scotty, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Penny, and thank you all of you for joining with us today to talk about hospitality on the farm. Um, and so the way I like to start this is just to say, okay, you've built it, they're coming, now what? Um, because the reality is you are not farming, you are in the hospitality business. And the way I want to break it down here today is to talk uh, about it in three parts, uh, and it's three parts that you control. So there's the presentation, which is your farm. There are the amenities that you're offering your guests, what's necessary for them to be comfortable and happy. And then managing and exceeding guest expectations, because that's what gets you to that five-star customer experience. So I don't know how many people think about this, but your very first presentation to guests is going to be on the internet. And it's most likely going to be your website. And your website will uh, create uh, the feeling of what are, what are people going to get when they come and see you. So it's really good to make sure that you have information that's easy to find, that you're easy to contact, and that if you are offering uh, tickets or lodging, that you offer that online. Because think of how you uh, shop and look at things online. If it can be easy and you can do it right then and there, that's what travelers and guests are looking for. And basically, the message you're sending is that easy equals welcoming. So you will be a fun place to come and visit. I'm going to use my website just as an example of what I mean by a clean website that has easy navigation there across the top in that green bar so that people can find what they're looking for. And you know, again, think of how what appeals to you online and its photographs. So we have lots and lots of photographs to kind of set the expectation for people. What are they going to get when they come to visit us at our farm? And make your copy really clear and really short. Because a lot of people don't like to read a lot these days. So have all the important stuff up at the front and within the first paragraph of anything that you write. And you can see here on our website, we've got our contact information right there. I do host guests on my farm for a farm stay. So the next thing you can do is you can make a reservation. And then um, we do have some retail items. We sell a book. So those are the things that you'll see above the fold on a website. Um, so think of that, that people don't like to spend a lot of time looking for information. I can't stress enough for any size operation, agritourism operation you have, if you're selling tickets or if you um, are selling overnight stays, if you can automate that, that will increase your traffic to your farm and that will make your customers happy because now they've done it, they can move on to the next thing in their busy life. 
Your next presentation is the outside of your farm. It starts right at your entrance. And again, I'm picking on my farm here because after I took this photograph and I went up and looked at my sign, I realized that it needed to be repainted. Um, a lot of people don't go and stand on the outside of their farm looking in as if they were a customer. I can't tell you how important that is to do. We just get used to what things look like and it's just going to be what it is. But for a first time guest, you are setting the expectations right there. And then the next place where you're setting those expectations is how you, your guests are introduced to you on your farm. Now, if you're doing a big operation, it might not be something that you can do personally, but it could be signage that is welcoming. Welcome to our farm. Welcome to our event. Um, if it's in person, smiling, happy people. But I think that it's smart on any size um, operation to also have written information for guests uh, because they're excited when they come and they may not be totally listening to what you have to say. Uh, it's very good to be clear how things work, where things are. Um, and for overnight guests, I always take them on something called a danger tour because I want to show them where they're allowed to be and where they're not and what's dangerous about our farm. Um, I think that when you do all of these things, whether it's a you pick, whether it's a wedding, whether it's a farm stay, whether it's an event, um, you're setting uh, your expectations for your guests right at the beginning. You're kind of setting the tone, and that will create a positive experience going forward. Your guests relax. You know, as I said, they are excited, but they are also a bit nervous. A lot of them are out of their element. And so you are welcoming and you are promising, basically, that, they are, that the experience will be um, educational, fun, different. And I've discovered that this also will reduce your liability and accidents. Um, on our farm, it just always seems that accidents happen in the first 30 minutes. And I would just have to say that's usually because the landscape is unfamiliar. And um, trip and fall, uh, maybe doing things that um, aren't appropriate on a farm that we would be surprised that people don't know, but um, it's surprising what people don't know, especially when they come from a, a from a city, from an urban background. So the next thing that I like to talk about are amenities, because if your guest is comfortable and you have satisfied their needs, um, that will make for a better experience for everybody involved. And um, this may be, this is different depending on the size of your operation, uh, but a lot of the amenities and the comforts and the needs for people are exactly the same. It just depends on how much of it you're offering. And I'm not going to talk too much here about the really large scale operations because Megan's going to do that in the next presentation. But parking and potties are obviously that number one concern um, of any big, big operation. Uh, and I will have to say that I, I couldn't not show this slide because this is the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival here in Oregon. And it's such a gorgeous picture. I was going to poach in on Megan just a little bit. Um, because you want to be thinking about what are people um, doing when they're with you? Are you making sure that they have enough to drink? Um, are you providing them food so they don't get cranky? Have you told them where to go? Have you told them what they need to know, how to be safe? Um, do you have friendly staff who are handling problems that come up a lot of times more with larger groups than smaller groups? But for this specifically, are you giving them um, the opportunities to take something away with them that will remind them of the visit that they had with you and how much fun that was and that they can share with people? So, okay, now we just jumped into marketing because um, all of these amenities that you're providing are photo ops a lot of times, and um, okay, not the potties, but any other kind of amenity, make sure that you can set it up so that people will share because that is going to end up on Facebook and that's going to end up with their friends and then their friends are going to want to come visit you. So on a more medium size uh, agritourism operation, I consider these things like a U-Pick or a farm stand on your farm. We're looking at comfort. You want to be able to provide shade if you're in Southern California. You want to be able to provide a rain structure if you're in Oregon. 
you can see in this picture, obviously, somebody's brought an umbrella. Uh, this is a picture from Oregon picking peaches, probably up in Hood River. And um, I also say in terms of another amenity, if you can create some seating for people, then they'll stay a while. Or maybe grandma and grandpa came uh, with the group. Uh, maybe the parents want to sit down while the kids are picking blueberries. Uh, just provide places where uh, people can rest a little while. In terms of informational signage, you know, how do you pick blueberries? Um, how do you pick peaches? Um, how do I weigh my uh, my fruit on a scale um, at the farm stand? It's um, amazing what people don't know how to do, and you want to also protect your product. Uh, in terms of pricing that I have here, I specifically put that in for farm stands. I have a special problem when I don't see things priced, then I don't like to buy them. So be very, very clear about that. And I consider that an amenity. And in terms of supplies, have you given your uh, people that you pick a bucket or a bag? Have you provided scale so people can gauge what it is they're going to be paying for? Uh, parking and potties on a more limited basis, but you need to think of where are people going to park uh, coming onto your farm, are they going to get stuck in the mud? Um, are they going to be uh, too far away? What have you done in terms of bathrooms? And maybe this is uh, just a porta potty, but um, it always seems that little kids on farms have to pee. So it would be good to think about that because that makes their parents more comfortable. And then water or hand cleaning stations. You know, urbanites look for this on a regular basis. I keep uh, a bottle out in my barn, and it's amazing how fast that bottle goes down and how much people are washing their hands. Um, maybe living on a farm, I'm just not as aware of needing to wash my hands as much. But that would be something that you want to provide. Weddings, I can speak to this actually as the mother of a bride who got married on a farm, not our farm. But um, I feel that these are really important amenities. And the farm that we went to did this perfectly for us. I was a very satisfied mother of the bride. Uh, backdrops for locations for photographs. Uh, that is an amenity. You want to set it up or you want to plan it. Uh, but you want to show your brides uh, where they can take those great photographs. Again, it's a marketing opportunity for you. Changing areas for the wedding party, this is a very useful uh, amenity to provide so that you don't have wedding parties, parties coming from hotels somewhere else. Um, there's always that last minute fix or that last minute change. Parking and potties, again, clear signage. And if you're using uh, porta potties, very, very clean for weddings. Access to electricity, you know, farms get dark in the, in the night. A lot of times we're not out there other than inside our barn. What kinds of lighting are you going to allow people to do? What kinds can you provide for them? Uh, urbanites get very afraid um, in dark countrysides. So you want to do that, not only for uh, the fear factor, but also for uh, people not tripping and falling. A hostess or a point person. Now, you'll need a point person anyway while people are trying to get their wedding set up. But having a hostess on site um, during the wedding is really, really useful. And um, you're, you can charge for that, I mean, included in your price. But that would be something that I would highly recommend. And it was certainly very useful for us. And then even ground at the ceremony site. OK, grandma and grandpa are coming to this wedding. Um, let's make sure that everybody is safe and can actually get to the ceremony. Farm stays, I can talk about the, the best. But I would just say, if you are offering people overnight lodging on your farm, they are staying with you 24-7. Um, in terms of your facility, be it a platform tent, be it a yurt, be it a, be it a guest house, be it in your farm house, clean bathrooms, clean bedrooms, clean kitchen, communal areas, no hair. Think of it just as what, what would you expect when you went to a hotel. Good beddings and linens, you know, we provide better sheets and towels for our guests than we actually have for ourselves. Boots, um, yeah, we're muddy up here, but people come with inappropriate footwear. And so if you can provide extra boots, I consider that a great amenity. Clear communications, you know, I have written farm rules, but we talk about what chore times are. Um, what's off limits, what's accessible, what, what, what can guests do? And I think if you're really clear with that, 
um, that makes for a good experience for everybody and you don't have somebody jumping onto your tractor um, unexpectedly. And then having a farm uh, guest uh, host on site um, is good. Uh, you don't want to just ditch your, your guests so that they feel that they're the farm managers and they don't know what they're doing. In terms of managing and exceeding expectations, you know, um, I often like to tell farms that are thinking of setting up farm stays that it's not actually that hard to provide a wow experience, just all on its own. There's really, uh, as long as you're clean and you're neat and you're safe, uh, these lambs just wow people to death because they've never seen uh, lambs. But it could be anything. It could be just your vistas. It could be your buildings. It could it could be your flowers. Um, so it's not that hard um, in terms of expectations. But these are the major concerns that guests have. Um, what are they going to expect in terms of comfort and familiarity? And I'll have to say on this um, slide, I've actually given you some links uh, to some videos that we did to try to address some of these concerns. But is it going to be dirty? That's a big question. Is it going to be boring? What am I going to do when I'm on this farm? What are my kids going to do? And the last one is, um, are, am I going to have to work? I'm paying money to be on this farm. Are they going to work me to death? So um, you need to understand that that's where people are coming from. Um, some are also concerned about a lack of connection to the outside world. Is my cell phone going to work? Am I going to have internet access? Now, this can go two ways, because some people don't want to be connected. But I will have to say that the majority of people want to make sure uh, that they will have some form of connection. And that's not such a bad thing, because if they're taking photographs on your site, then they can be sharing those with their friends as they're at your place. They're also concerned about safety, you know, emergency services, um, how should they be around the animals, how should they be around the equipment, the countryside, it's really dark at night. Um, and so I just, I alleviate those all at the very beginning. And in terms of managing their expectations, I also want to make sure I handle problems immediately. So you need to think about the kinds of plans, kind of uh, practice what would happen if this happened? What would you do if this happened? You know, what are you going to, how are you going to um, do it if you have guests like this? And just think of it as treating guests the way you would want to be treated. If there, if you had a problem going somewhere, you want to be listened to, uh, you want somebody on it, you want somebody to check in with you that they've, they've solved your problem. Um, and that is what I would consider managing the expectations. But then, exceeding expectations. This is the going above and beyond. And this is often what people remember and what people tell their friends about. And it's just the little things. It's not that hard to do. But I would suggest things like photo contests. I noticed that Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival has a photo contest where pictures with your pet, pictures with a background, pictures of children all on their farm. And then people share these. And they have a photo contest. So that's a great opportunity for people to show off. It's also, though, a great um, opportunity for them to show off your farm. Recipes. If you are at a farm stand, or you are doing you pick, or even for me, I make bread for my guests, I sh we share those recipes. And if you can do that, then they're going to buy more of what you have or be happier with what you do. If you can provide classes, or even just observation. Uh, cooking classes are a big one. Weaving, cheese, soap making, crafting. Um, if I'm making jam, I'll let people come into the to the farmhouse and watch what I'm doing. If they want to help, maybe they get to walk away with uh, a jar of jam. But hands-on opportunities. So you can see in this picture, it's a little girl feeding a, a lamb. And you can see the expression on her face. People just want to be able to collect those eggs. Um, Pet that goat. Um, just be part of be part of what's going on on the farm. It's not that they want to be farmers necessarily, but they don't mind being farmers for a weekend, and they want to be able to go back and tell their friends that they had these experiences. Um, they love insider recommendations. Where should they go for the best food, the best wine, the restaurants, things to do, driving routes from and to your place. Um, I do handwritten thank you notes after people have come and visited with us. And you could do that for classes, too. I know if you're a really big operation, obviously you're not going to do that. But do you have some sort of email list that you've been collecting that you can thank people for being with you? And then finally, um, I can't say enough about having friendly staff and farmers. Um, 
people are coming to your farm, they want to know who you are, they want to know why you do this, they want to make a connection uh, on your farm, and again, it's not a hard thing to do, just tell your story and uh, they will soak it up. I have found that my guests are very, very respectful when they come on my farm and they just want to know what we do. Um, and then I should say in my case, exceeding those expectations, one of the things I do do is we have fairy houses in our forest. I didn't realize how big fairies were until we, we did this. And um, yeah, if you've got forests like mine, put in fairy houses and you'll learn all about fairies. What makes guests want to come back? Their kids enjoyed it. They learned something. They were able to relax. It was better than they expected. It was fun. They were welcomed and they were thanked. So you need to know that if you're in agritourism, that's hospitality on your farm. Make it a five-star experience. Thank you very much, and I will answer any questions that anybody Thank has. Thank you at the very end of much, Scotty. That was great. And if you have any more questions for Scotty, you can type them in in the question and answer uh, screen there in the box on the left of your screen, and we'll put them to Scotty at the end of the presentations. And now we are going to hear from Megan Bishop Sanderson. Megan Bishop Sanderson is one of the third generation Bishop family members working full-time at Bishop's Pumpkin Farm. And if uh, you don't know this, Bishop's Fum Pumpkin Farm is one of the biggest pumpkin farms, uh, pumpkin farms and corn mazes in California and perhaps in the United States. Uh, Megan works alongside one of her brothers and her parents year-round. They all wear many hats in their positions at the farm, but Megan is mainly the human resources manager and event manager. Manager. She's been back full time at the farm for two years after graduating from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 2013 and spending a year in the produce business. Okay, Megan, it's all yours. All right, thank you so much, Penny. So um, as she mentioned, my name is really just Megan Sanderson, but I have a hard time dropping the bishop, even though I've been married for a year. So here we are. Um, my grandparents started our farm in 1973. So again, as she mentioned, myself, one of my older brothers, and my parents, Ann and Wayne, run the farm on a day-to-day, year-long basis now. Um, we, and we hire about 475 seasonal employees each year, and that process actually just started this week, and it actually takes me longer to go through my hiring process than they actually work for me. Um, we will see approximately 180,000 people this year in the six weeks that were open, and we really build our business around six of our busiest days, which are those three middle weekends in October, and um, those usually see 10 to 12,000 customers each day. So we um, really believe that being in agritourism starts with understanding what your brand is, and a huge part of your brand is always going to include customer service. So your brand is not just your logo, um, it's not what you're saying in your marketing materials, um, it's more what people perceive you to be. So it's whether your farm is dusty or not, it's the weather while they were there, it's the amount of fun they had, was it loud, entertaining, smelly, all of these small details are what play a role in people perceiving who you are as a tourist destination. Customers' service plays a huge role in how they perceive you to be. For example, if you go to a car dealership, you can pretty much assume you aren't going to be able to walk through that lot alone, making your own opinion about the cars, and you can sure as heck assume that they are going to want to have you come sit in their office while they quote unquote crunch some numbers. So that's automatically how we perceive a car dealership before we even go there, it doesn't matter what car or uh, that they're selling. Um, so that's what you have to think about when you're really establishing your brand. So once you've had that figured out, you're going to have a lot easier time improving your customer service exp experience because you're going to know what you want them to perceive you to be. So we believe this really starts with the employees. So those 470 employees are crucial to our business and to our customer service. So we rely very heavily on word of mouth marketing and we feel that it's important to ensure our customers have the best possible time the first time they visit the farm. 
So we have a fairly detailed interview process that's been developed over the years. Um, it involves all the applicants to do an initial meet and greet, so we don't allow them to submit the application online. We make them come see us in person to turn it in. They'll meet either myself or one of the HR assistants and immediately start getting a score. They then are given an online interview. They get scored on that based on some behavioral questions and just basic what they are willing to do at the farm. Are they willing to dress up in a pig costume and walk through a parade or no? Are they willing to be involved in food service, that kind of thing? Um, so based on those two scores at that point, we start doing group interviews. So about half of our employees are usually under the age of 18, so we really pay a lot of attention to these particular employees as they're usually the ones that need the most training because they just don't have as much experience as an adult. So we require they do a little bit of mingling prior to the group interview. We give them a little interview bingo to do and we have our managers watch that. Are they really getting out of their bubble and, and talking to the other potential employees or are they just kind of being shy on the side which is totally fine but that definitely can help us figure out where they might fit best in a position here at the farm. So um, they then are required to do a team project in groups of 10 that we put them in. Um, so they do this group project and we really pay attention to who's taking the lead, who's being a helper, who really does not care at all what's going on. Uh, all of these things again are going to show us what kind of employees they are going to be. They then do a group interview with three different managers that's rotating around um, and basically the whole purpose of this long interview um, process is to really establish what they're like around their peers and where they would fit best in the farm. So example like I keep mentioning them being shy. Um, then they're probably going to be best behind the scenes in a food service uh, type position. So um, we hire the highest scored applicants based on all these things they've done to this point. Um, last year we accepted probably right around 600 applicants and uh, only had about 250 open spots because we usually have about half of our employees return from previous years. So then we do an orientation, that's something we continue to develop to ensure that our employees understand what we expect them. Um, of them, I should say. This is usually lasts about an hour and it's when we really go over how we want them to serve our customers. So we'll go over that a little bit in the next slide. We also strongly believe in being servant leaders. So servant leaders are uh, what, what we understand to be um, when you have an employee, you have to give them the tools they need to succeed. So we try to do that to our managers, make sure that they have all the tools they need in order to run an efficient operation. And um, under, we understand that if we don't give them those tools, they might not be able to do what we actually expect them to do. So we hope by providing those tools to our main managers, they can then provide those to the frontline employees. So to continue with the employee training, I was talking about, um, again, those teenagers they are usually uh, first-time workers, so they've never had a job before. We hire as young as 14 and freshmen in high school. So that means they have a lot of learning to do in the workplace. A lot of them haven't seen a workplace before and just don't know exactly what's okay and what's not okay. So we feel very strongly um, that we are responsible in teaching them positive work habits like coming to work on time, having a positive attitude, being res respectful, and most importantly, having great customer service. So we spend a lot of time in training these things. So one of those things is the A game. So this is just continuing to drive the point home of doing a good job. So the A's include attitude, attendance, appearance, ambition, accountability, acceptance, and appreciation. So we ask them to bring their A game every time they come to work. So we also want them to exceed customer expectations. Scotty talked about this quite a bit too. So it's a basic thing. Just instead of saying, welcome to Bishop's Pumpkin Farm, we ask them to say, good morning, welcome to Bishop's, hope you have a great day. Or even actions that will exceed their expectations. So take their tray to the trash can for them, help them carry food to the table, or replace a dropped ice cream cone. These kinds of things will really make that customer's experience above and beyond. And then there's the 10 rule rule. This is another basic that we teach. So if a customer is 10 feet away, you should make eye contact with them, smile or wave to them. When they're about four feet away, acknowledge them. Welcome to Bishop's, good morning, anything like that. So then we also want our employees to understand that they may get a complaint while they're wearing a Bishop's Pumpkin Farm employee shirt. We would love to control these on our own, but we can't. There's not nearly enough of us. 
so we want them to be aware on how we want them to handle it. So we want them to listen to the guest, hear out what they're saying, stay calm and never argue with the guest, acknowledge them and assure the guest that we want to help them, remedy and fix the situation if you can or ensure it will be taken care of as soon as possible and of course thank them and let them know we appreciate their concern and we will do our best to fix it. So we always tell our employees to remember that the customers might not always be right but they will always be our customer. So we also want to make sure that our employees know all of the basic customer information, where our bathrooms are, the ATMs, and our basic policies regarding pets and smoking and that kind of thing. So we um, truly believe in listening to the customer and we'll do that in a variety of ways, um, you know, talking to the customer one-on-one, -on -one, listening to what our employees are saying based on the customer and this kind of thing. Uh, what the customers are saying and this sort of thing. So again, the word of mouth marketing is very big for us. We don't do a lot of other marketing, so we have to impress them on the first visit, otherwise they might not come back. Customers complain, it's just what they do. So uh, we follow TripAdvisor, Yelp, Facebook, and all those social media um, sites very closely to try to monitor those um, to monitor those complaints. So we have to understand that not all of the complaints are gonna be in control today. Example, they're gonna complain if it's hot or not and we just cannot control that. So um, we just wanna control what we can. So we always have enterprise meetings with our department department managers and we always start those meeting off, meetings off with what are the complaints? What do the customers say they didn't like? How can we fix them? So we believe that the customers are the true under, uh, true owners of the farm, so we let them guide us in our growth decisions. Um, one story my dad likes to say uh, in, about fixing things that you can't really is um, that one, a, a while back we used to have a dairy calf and that dairy calf um, would get a lot of complaints based on its size. People would say it's too skinny, we were underfeeding it, abusing it, etc. So in this case we had to decide is this something we want to continue to try to educate the customer on when they might not ever understand that's how a calf is supposed to look or do we give up and choose a different way to educate. We gave up unfortunately. Um, as much as I love cute dairy calves we had to give up and uh, we chose a different way to educate our customers. So for example on our bathrooms we list different kinds of females and male animals on the respect sides. So um, you have to grow to accommodate the busiest days. So as I mentioned, we have six really busy days and we have to accommodate those size crowds. So when we're building something, we have to think, is this going to handle 10,000 people in one day? Um, another huge line that my dad likes to use is to underpromise and overdeliver. This is um, something that we really follow when especially doing parties and weddings and birthday parties. So we want to tell the customer we'll do ABC but then also do XYZ. So we realized we were doing the opposite in our birthday party. We would pretty much provide them or promise them we'd give them the world and we didn't end up doing that. So instead of leaving them excited about their experience, they were often disappointed. So we kind of switched the roles there, told them we would provide this and then you know do little things that make their experience better. So um, we feel very strongly about having a set core values that will help you in guiding your business. Um, so one of those values for us is to be authentic, be who we say we're going to be. Um, we hope that people know who we are, not just that we're a corporation, because we're not, we're just a family of uh, not a huge family just running uh, this business. So. Um, we want to find ways that we can be personable and so one of those ways is our news, our newsletter that we send out um, once a year, uh, about a week or so before we open. It goes to 10 or 12 different um, newspapers as inserts, it also is a direct mailer and this uh, is mostly written by my dad, Wayne, but my brother and I also usually help with an article or two and we always write about what's new on the farm, we try to educate them about any changes, but then we also want to tell them about any new stuff on the farm, did someone get married, did we have another grandchild, anything like that. Uh, the same philosophy goes for our face our Facebook. We don't use it as a sales pitch 95% of the time. Every now and then we might tell them about a special offer or promote an event, but we rarely do any giveaways. Um, we actually have only done two that I can think of. So we don't pay for any likes. Uh, we want to believe that the customers that follow us on Facebook truly like us and are interested in what we do on a year-round basis. So again, we also use Facebook as a platform to talk about family news. 
So we also feel um, very strongly about being involved in the community. So we do this in a variety of ways. Um, one of those ways is our Run Your Gourd Off event, which is always the second weekend that we're open in September. Um, it benefits a different charity every year. This year it's um, benefiting the Child Abuse Prevention Center out of Sacramento that my brother serves on their board. Um, they do a great job at, at what they do as a charity and also have, have really benefited us a lot. Um, we also have a corn maze and every year we feature a different charity in that corn maze. Last year it was Make-A-Wish, so we take um, some of the profits from the second weekend we're open and we donate that to the charity of our choice for each year. Um, we also do the Golden Autumn Wine Festival, which this year will be our third annual event um, and this benefits the Yuba Sutter United Way. We also are, are involved in the Pink Pumpkin Patch Foundation, so we grow the porcelain doll pumpkins and a portion of those sales goes to support breast cancer research. So we feel like that letting our customers know that we're heavily involved in the community, that we care. So we don't want them to think we're selfish people by any means. We want them to know and understand that we're very involved in the community. So we also understand as business owners that there's always going to be room for improvement. You're never doing everything you could. Um, you just have to always do what you can to improve. So every time we add something new or change a price, um, we know we have to educate the customer to try to head off any new challenges. So we have to be ready to adapt to them if we forgot something. So we have to be ready to head off any uh, other challenges. Um, we continue to improve and update our employee handbook and training PowerPoints every year. If the customer doesn't teach us something new about what we want our employees to provide them, usually the employee will uh, do something you realize you have to add to the rules, um, especially when you hire a lot of teenagers. They're always going to do something that you didn't think they were possible of doing and now you have a new rule for your handbook. My mom always tells our, our employees during the orientation, she um, she tries to bet them that they won't do anything that we can't add to our handbook. So we try to, every year we try to encourage them to let us use the handbook two years in a row, but that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, we also have to keep listening to the customers in that variety of ways that we do. Facebook, um, social, just general social media and review sites. There's so many platforms for customers to express their opinions on and nowadays people are not shy whatsoever about expressing those opinions. Unfortunately, sometimes they're very rude and, and you don't want to hear it, but you have to listen to those in order to stay on top of what they're thinking. Um, and that way you can really in, make improve, reasonable improvements and, and accommodate those complaints. And again, you have to remember when you're reading them that you can't always make an improvement. There are going to be things that you just can't change and that a customer is just going to have to understand that hopefully. So to finish here, this photo is from a weekend pig race that we do. Um, uh, so the basics from this talk is that we believe you really have to listen to the customer. You have to understand um, that they're going to tell you what's right and they're also going to tell you what's wrong and they're not going to hesitate to do that. Um, and then also uh, I'll mention over and over again that the employees are your core. You're, they're the frontline people. They're the people that are going to directly interact with the customers more so than we are, even though we're here year-round. So uh, we definitely want to do the best to make sure those employees are prepared for whatever may be thrown their way. So thank you so much for your time, and we'll answer questions here in thank a bit. Thank you very much, Megan. That was great. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead, type in more questions, and uh, we've got plenty of time. We'll be asking both Scotty and Megan questions. Now, the first one here coming up is for Scotty. Uh, question is, how do you deal with comments about messy outdoor areas relating to farm operations? So, um, I think basically in the introduction when I show people our farm, and I'm going to specifically talk about my own, um, 
Well, I got to tell you, I, that actually hasn't been a problem. Um, we do have some messy areas. What I try to do, I'm going to do this a different way. Up around our cottage, which is where we host guests, and around our farmhouse, I make sure that that is uh, mowed and weed eated and looks really, really neat. So that is usually a surprise to people. So the place looks better than they thought because that's where they're spending some of their time. That's certainly their first impression. When we get over to the barn and we've got piles of wood or we've got manure piles, I just explain why those things are there. So in terms of compost, that's a huge opportunity for me to talk about composting and to actually demonstrate how composting works. So I guess instead of thinking of it as messy, I turn it around and say, this is why this works like this, and this is why this pile is here. Thank you. OK, we have a question for Megan. Megan, how do you maintain great customer service on your busiest days, those days when you've got more than 10,000 people there? Yeah, so those days are always going to be the days that we get the most complaints because obviously that's when the lines are going to be long. Uh, that's just when we're really pushing capacity. Um, so we actually really encourage our, our customers not to come on those days. Um, we do what's called dynamic pricing and actually charge a little more on those days because we really want to encourage them to come earlier in the season or come on a weekday when we can really give them a much better experience. Um, but we also train our employees specifically for those days. So when it's shorter, slower, earlier in the year, we um, just really tell them to just wait because they have no idea what's coming and they never quite believe us until that day shows up. But um, we just we really feel like we rely on our training during those days and then also making sure customers know that there are other days to come that they're going to have a much better experience. Thank you. Uh, OK, back to Scotty. Um, do you need a permit in Oregon to hold a wedding on a farm? I know you do in California, but uh, what's Oregon like for that? So in Oregon, um, it depends on the, the county that you're in. And I thought that was also how it is in California. It depends on the county in terms of what the regulations are. So in some counties here, you can hold up to six weddings without getting a permit. Um, and then over a certain number, you need to have a permit. So I would say for anybody who's looking into doing weddings, uh, to check with your county planning department. Because it's for us, it's case by case. And um, it, there's no rhyme or reason, as far as I can tell. Thank you. Um, back to Megan. Now, this this is kind of a, a large question, but off the top of your head, okay. what advice do you have for a farmer considering hiring a crew of teenagers? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, be patient. <laughs> uh, teenagers will teach you more than you can probably teach them. Um, but you know, also there's a great opportunity in the ability to teach teenagers how to be a good employee. Um, that's that's one of our core values is to educate, and we feel like one of those ways we educate is those teenage employees. And they are often also the hardest workers we'll have because they just want to do the best they can for you. So um, I would just, the main piece of advice I would give you, though, is to be patient. <laughs> Thank you. And, and this one's for you, too, Megan. When you host such big events, okay. do you somehow promote other farmers in your area with agritourism or other consumer programs? And if so, how? Yeah, so we actually have started doing that with our Golden Autumn Wine Festival. One of the main reasons we wanted to start that is because there's a great, great wine region not far from where we're at that a lot of people don't know about because they just automatically assume in California you either go to Lodi or Napa to get wine, but they don't know about the hills um, right above where we are here in Wheatland. So we um, really encouraged that event to bring in other farmers and allow our customers to meet those farmers when, you know, cause, because we're so close. So we do like to tag team a little bit with those types of local small farms and try to help each other in kind of opening the door to new uh, customers that we might not Could have had Could you talk on our a little own. bit about how you do that? 
how. Um, we, we do a lot of cross promotion with our, so we charge parking on the weekend, so we'll often um, hand out a flyer or something. We also use that newsletter. Um, the newsletter is our main way of, of marketing, so we will list the wineries there um, so people kind of get a gist of, of who they are and where Thanks. they're at. Yeah, I hope that answers. That. Okay, yeah. back to Scotty. Um, Scotty, can you speak more about the U.S. Farm Stay Association and what that is and how it helps members and who are the members? Sure, absolutely. So uh, the U.S. Farm Stay Association is a trade association that we formed to help working farms and ranches that offer overnight lodging. Um, market themselves, be all in one place because we were scattered all over the country with our own websites. And um, we formed this back in 2010. What we provide for farmers is if they're first timers thinking of offering a farm stay, we have a whole business guide. You know, is this something you really want to do? And what should you expect? And what do you need to be planning for? Um, but the, our website, which is farmstayus.com, also educates travelers because one of the top, um, other than searching for farms, the top question asked on the site is, what is a farm stay? And then the second top question is, what can I expect? Um, so we are answering those questions for uh, our farmers um, to be able to then receive those kinds of guests. Um, and we are national. Um, it's funny, our largest group of members is out of California, and that is the area that appears to be the hottest in terms of increasing uh, membership and increasing farm stays. I think um, it's because there are some large urban areas right there, and we just we help our farmers uh, learn how to provide good hospitality, um, how to market, and then we do that for them as well. Thank you. Um, we have a question which is for either of you. It might be more uh, more Scotty's area. It might be for Meg. Uh, do you have any recommendations about umbrella insurance policies for vacation rentals? I have five cottages, says the, says the questioner. Any suggestions? Uh, let's go to you first, Scotty. I would say have it. <laughs> I mean, I would. I, I don't know what the, the suggestion would be. Yes, you need an umbrella policy, um, especially to cover those five vacation rentals. Um, we do that uh, for our own farm. It's not that expensive to add an umbrella policy, and it just ups your liability usually to two or four million dollars. It depends on what it is, but we're we're talking, you know, maybe five to seven hundred and fifty dollars at least up here in Oregon. Um, but no, I would absolutely recommend that. You, you never know. I would say something else to do on your farm. I assume these are vacation rentals on your farm. Um, make sure that you've posted any kind of um, liability signs that you might have. If you have uh, horses, you know, we have an equine law here in Oregon. I think you have one in California. Make sure you have those signs posted on your fences. When you guys get that limited liability agritourism law, which I think you all are working on this year, make sure you have that posted um, at the entrance to your farm. That, while it's not an umbrella policy, does allow, does tell your guests um, or make them aware a little bit of the fact that they're coming onto a property that might uh, be more dangerous than, um, not that it's more dangerous, that, that you, they, that it just makes them aware of what they're coming onto as far as the property. Thank you. And I think I understand, Scotty, that somebody might contact you and get some specific recommendations for insurance providers. Is that true? Sure. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I have a list of providers, uh, and so I can um, give those to anybody that's interested in terms of, of providers who have been interested or who have offered agritourism policies before. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, Scotty's contact information will be posted with the slides, or you can um, look up uh, Farm Stay US on the website and find her that way. Uh, question for Meg. How do you handle negative feedback about your events or facilities? 
Uh, it depends on the feedback itself. Um, sometimes if the feedback is just kind of outrageous, we just let that person have their opinion and choose to, I, I wouldn't say ignore it, but we just don't acknowledge it, let them, let them have that. Uh, we have had some extreme situations where they'll mention a direct employee. Uh, that I can think of one case in particular, and we actually asked um, Yelp to remove it because it was kind of going directly after a particular employee who was just having a bad day. Um, but if it's negative feedback that we can handle, we respond to them directly, um, and you know we we again thank them for bringing it to our attention, and then we figure out how we can fix it. Uh, we also, if we think they are incorrect, we'll just kind of tell them, actually we do X Y Z, or we'll just try to explain why that might have happened to them or anything Thank like Thank you. That. Good plan. Um, so here's a question for uh, coming from somebody in a completely different region from you. These guys are nowhere near Wheatland. Uh, do, you, do you have any tips for a smaller <laughs> program to eventually grow into a popular regional event like Bishop's Farm? Well, we've been doing this for 43 years now, so it's taken us a while <laughs> to get this big. Um, but one of the big, one of the main things that I can think of that really put us over the edge was figuring out how we could extend the customers' stay here at the farm. Um, so we wanted to add play areas, but at the same time we were adding play areas, maybe we should add some food because then they'll stay for a meal. So we figured out how we could get them to stay for lunch. So we've added a lot of food over the years. Uh, my mom likes to say we're actually a restaurant on a farm, not a farm. Um, and we also, now that we've gotten lunch under wrap, we're now trying to get dinner. And so what that means is adding a fireworks show at night or really just figuring out how to extend that customer's stay by adding different play areas, different attractions, different events and entertainment. Um, what's going to really make the customer want to stay at your farm and then bring people back for a full day of fun. Um, and I think that's what's helped us kind of go to the Thank next you. level. Um, back to Scotty for a question here. Is it ever an issue to have strangers on your farm? Um, what I would like to say about that is that I they may come as strangers, but they certainly leave as friends. And within that first 30 minutes that I talked about where I take them around, I get to kind of know who they are, and I let them know who I am as well. And so I don't consider them strangers once we have had that introduction. Um, it's funny, my husband <laughs> is not as interested in talking to people he doesn't know right away. So he will sometimes jump on the tractor. And he's very friendly from the tractor. He will wave and he'll smile. But it means he doesn't actually have to say anything to anybody. So um, you know that we all have different ways of, of handling that. And the one caveat I would say for anybody who's interested in agritourism, which does mean hosting strangers on your property, is that there has to be a point person. There has to be somebody out front who likes talking to people, who um, is engaging, who likes to tell their story, who likes to find out the stories of the guests. And then that breaks it all down. Um, if there is nobody on your farm that is interested in doing that kind of thing, you will likely not have a very successful agritourism um, program. So make sure when you are thinking of starting something up that everybody's on board in the family. They can deal with it one way or another even if it's jumping on the tractor, but that there is a point person there who will be that friendly, welcoming face to say hello and then to say thank you. Thank you. That was great. And that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, you can put in, type in any more questions you'd like. We'll keep the question and answer box open for a while. And we'll be continuing the conversation on Farms Reach in the California Agritourism Group. So we hope to be chatting with you there. If you have any more questions for the presenters, uh, you can ask them there. If you have any comments, things you'd like to ask the agritourism community in California in general. You can type them in and we'll put them uh, into the group or you can just join the Farms, Farms Reach California Agritourism group and we will continue to chat there. Um, 
please tell us a little bit, uh, complete the poll right under the um, presentation on your screen and tell us whether you learned anything today. We always like to know whether this has been useful to you. And uh, that this is our last webinar. So we really appreciate you all participating in it. The webinars have all been recorded. You can go to the Farms Reach California Agritourism Group, see all the recordings. We are also posting all the presentation slides with the link. So anytime there's a link, they'll be posted both on Farms Reach and on the project website on the UC Small Farm Program page. And. Uh, that's basically it for today. Thank you very much, and we look forward to talking with all of you on the California Agritourism Group and Farms Reach and later in the year when we plan our regional conferences all over California. Thank you, and have a great day.